We welcome all of you on live stream who have joined us. We're very thankful to God that we can maintain a fellowship with people in spite of distance. This will be the third series message in this series on the coming of the Lord. There's be 40 sermons altogether. Now there's some things in Scripture concerning which there's no doctrine. It might surprise you to know the will. The Bible has no doctrine on the will of man. Interesting, isn't it? <laughs> but there is a doctrine. Doctrine is another word for teaching. There is a teaching, a doctrine on the second coming of Christ. Amen. But you'd never know it from what's being said about it. Amen. There's an awful lot of private opinions yeah. sounded about the second coming of Christ. Mm -hmm. I've mentioned this before. I'll mention it again. You cannot be wrong about Jesus. Amen. You cannot. Now, God's very sensitive about this. He's given a record of his son. It's uh, one of John's statements about the gospel, the record God has given of his son. It's 1 John 5, 10, and 11. And eternal life hinges on our acceptance of the record. I say the record. Amen. The recorded record yes. of what God said about His Son. You can't be wrong about Him. You yes. cannot. If God has said anything about Jesus, you cannot be wrong about it. Yes. I mean, your life hinges on this, brethren. Now, the precious few people actually believe this because there are a significant division among the professed church over the coming of the Lord. There are special teachings about it, the premillennial teaching, the postmillennial teaching, the amillennial teaching, the preterist teaching. They all of those have one thing in common. Not a one of them is about Christ's coming. All of them are about things that are professed to attend Christ's coming. But I'm not talking about what attends Christ's coming. We're talking about his coming. Now, when referring to Christ's coming or his appearing, there's a remarkable clarity in Scripture. You will not find a text in Scripture that clearly is talking about Christ's coming that is ambiguous or hard to understand or not plain enough. You will not find such a thing. Now, this is important, particularly important that we understand this because for those who believe, words pertaining to salvation and its initiation, its experience, and its culmination are of necessity noted for clarity. Yes, amen. Is there anything in the Bible about coming into Christ? It's not vague. Yes. <laughs> And Peter, when people cried out to Peter, what must we do to be saved? He, <laughs> what shall we do? Or when the, Ethiopian, when the Philippian jailer says, what must I do to be saved? That's the only place in the Bible that question is asked, incidentally. The answer was not vague. People weren't unsure about what was said. When the scriptures talk about how you're to live in Christ, they're not vague. It's nothing ambiguous about it. It's not parabolic. Mm -hmm. It's not symbolic. Mm -hmm. It's right straight to the point. Yes, because your life hinges on your identity with Christ, and all you know about Christ is what God's revealed. Amen. You don't know anything else about him at all. Right. Only what he's revealed. And when it comes to how this thing's going to be concluded, it's not ambiguous. It's very clear. Now, I want to, first of all, I, I'm... The subject I mentioned on, he shall appear. Mm -hmm. To those who look for him, he shall appear. Now, this doesn't mean he'll only appear to those looking for him. That's not what the text is saying. That's right. I'm sorry, premillennialists, but that's just, that's just like ace. Mm -hmm. 
Jesus is not going to sneak back. Amen. He snuck out. Yes. He snuck in the first time. Came in incognito the first time. He's not coming in incognito the second time. Amen. I want to define what I mean when I say he shall appear. I want to take a little time to define what I'm talking about. To appear, obviously, is the opposite from conceal. I mean, that's <laughs> kind of kindergartenish, but that's, you have to say that once in a while. Because if some people think he's going to come concealed yeah. the next uh -huh. time. No, he came concealed the first time. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the only time God will conceal Jesus. Amen. Yeah. Next time he comes in, everybody's going to know. Next time he leaves heaven, everybody's going to know. He's going to appear. Amen. Now, the word appear, for those who may have an interest in this, there's three different words used for his appearing in the, in the scripture, writing of the apostles. One of them is our text, he shall appear the second time. The word appearing means uncovering, mm -hmm. lay bare. <laughs> One meaning is take out of hiding. Or disclose or reveal. So that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking yeah. about yeah. up here. Hebrews 9.28, our text is used here. It means literally to allow oneself to be seen. Presently, <coughs> Jesus has not allowed himself to be seen. He's hidden from physical view. It doesn't make any difference how keen your vision is. You cannot see Jesus. This is a period of faith. Yeah. If you don't believe in Jesus, well, you're out. Right. If you're thinking you're going to wait till he appears and then make up your mind, like you couldn't possibly be more wrong. Yeah, amen. Right. Amen. He's going to be seen or made visible. Not to these eyes, because the dead are going to be raised. Every eye is going to see him, so we're not going to be in these bodies. Yeah, yeah. Everyone's going to see him at the same time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Saint and sinner alike. Mm -hmm. He's going to appear. Mm -hmm. Every eye will see him. Now this is an appearance as distinguished from a vision. There are visions like Saul had on the road to Damascus and like Paul had when Christ just appeared to him in Corinth. Those were visions. But Jesus was veiled. He didn't appear in all his glory. He was pretty bright when he appeared on Damascus, wasn't it? You had seen nothing yet. He was veiled in all those appearances. When he appeared to the two on the road to the mass, Mark says he appeared to them in another form. He was, he was disguised, in other words. Yeah. A second use of the word appears found in 1 John 2.28. It says, when he shall appear, there it means to make manifest or make known or show. This is like from God's viewpoint, God's going to, God's going to show his son. Yeah, he's been, for a little over 2,000 years now, God, through the gospel, has been telling people that Jesus is. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. He was and he is. Yeah. Uh -huh. He is and he is to come. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, I was dead, yeah. but I'm alive. See, you have to take his word for that right now. Amen. But he's going to show him. He's going to show a living Christ. The same one that's right now, he's going to show him. And Titus 2.12 says we're to, we're, the word appear, we are to look for his glorious appearing. Yeah. Amen. Titus 2.12 says, it's an outward show, a glorious appearing. Glory. Now you don't want to look up a dictionary definition for glory because it's pretty bad, I tell you. 
whether you're looking at a Greek lexicon or an English, the, word, the definition of glory is pretty, <laughs> pretty meager. What glory is what can be seen. The glory of the sun is what can be seen. That's his glory. The glory of Jesus, he's going to appear, Jesus said, in all his glory. Yeah. <laughs> and no one's going to miss that. Amen. No one's going to miss it. He's going to appear in all his glory. And Luke says he's going to appear in his glory and the glory of the Father and the glory of the angels. That's about all the glory there is right there. Yeah. So how are you going to hide that? It's, the, it's an appearing of that in, in glory. So here's how I'm going to use the word appearing. You may or may not agree with it, but that, that, that really doesn't make any difference to me. It's going to be, he's going to be uncovered. Jesus is going to be uncovered. He's going to be brought out of hiding. He's going to be brought out of concealment. He's going to be revealed or disclosed. Jesus is going to allow himself to be seen Amen. in all of his fullness, in all of his glory. We're actually going to see him, not have a vision of him. Jesus is going to be made known, revealed, caused to become visible, caused to be seen. I mean an outward showing of Jesus outside the confines of heaven. Yeah. Now in our text, Hebrews 9.28 is the third of three appearings that's mentioned in verse 24, 26, and 28. Verse 24 says he's now appearing in the presence of God for us. Verse 26 says once in the end of the world he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And verse 28 says to them and look for him till he appear. Now the, this parallels the ministry of the high priest on the day of atonement. On the Day of Atonement, the high priest went into the most holy place and disappeared from the people's vision. Before he went in there, the people saw him. While he was in there, the people didn't see him. But when the intercession was over, he came out. And when he came out, the intercession was over. I say the intercession was over. When Jesus appears the next time, the intercession is over. There's going to be no more initial experience of salvation. Like people being one to Christ without the gospel, without the church, and all this. It's not going to be. That's over. The day of salvation as we know it now is over. When the high priest leaves. Now his appearing, by way of introduction, is going to remove all doubt. Now that Jesus is in heaven, people indulge in a lot of speculations. There's a lot of questions asked. Some people say, well, is Jesus real? They actually have the nerve to do it with a furrowed brow. Is Jesus real? Is the Bible true? Which version is right? Am I to believe every word of God? <laughs> Do I really have to be holy? The important I'm making here is these questions are asked because Jesus can't be seen. Yes, that's right. Uh -huh. that's the only, yes. That is the only reason mm -hmm. these questions are asked. Will God receive imperfect people like me? Now the reason those questions are asked is because Jesus has not yet appeared. Yes. Uh -huh. But when Jesus appears, not one of these questions are going to be asked. Amen. Amen. Nobody's going to say, who's that? Yeah. Or we wish not who he was. Mm -hmm. Nobody. Nobody's going to have any questions about the Bible. That's right. No one's going to have any questions about whether you ought to be holy or not, mm -hmm. or how holy you should be. Or is God going to save you after you've fallen away? These are all questions that are asked because Jesus can't be seen. You say, how do we counteract those? We need to preach the reality of Christ Amen. with such power and conviction. People are ashamed to ask such questions. Amen. The appearing will burn up everything that caused doubt. <clears throat> there will not be a doubting soul 
that was born from Adam to the end of the world. Everybody's going to know who it is. Everybody's going to know why he's coming. Everybody's going to know whether they're ready or whether they're not. They're going to know in an instant. They'll know. And I'll tell you right now, if you're not ready for that, it's your business to get ready for it. That's what salvation is calculated to do. Salvation is calculated to get you ready for the appearing because God's not looking for a reason to condemn anybody. But there's going to be a lot of people condemned. See, God's not willing that any should perish, but some are going to perish. He's told us about it. That's not your business to sit around crying because they're perishing. Do something about it. Preach Christ to tell him what he, who he is and where he's at and what he's doing, what he's done. Tell them what he's done. Tell them this. If they don't believe it, just move on to the next person. But I'm telling you that when men are going to be faced with the raw, unvarnished, and incontestable truth of Jesus Christ when he appears, it's going to be plain. And it's our business to be ready. All right, let me take some of the text tonight. This will not be profound unless you think about it. <laughs> then, then it will be rather profound. These are texts have to do with Christ's appearing. What's going to happen when he appears? What's going to happen when he's made known, when he's seen, when he leaves heaven? What's going to make be made known? Well, Jesus told people that there's going to be a disruption of nature prior to it. Here's Matthew 24, 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, then shall appear the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming, they will see him coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And notice the precision with which this is stated. It doesn't say he's going to come and hover over the earth. That's right. <laughs> oh, this would be good news to the wicked. They'd like to hear something like this. He's going to come and hover over the earth, snatch all the saved people out. Then we're going to go back to heaven with him. Then there's going to be a period of great tribulation, then we're all going to come back. He's going to set up his kingdom on earth, reign out of Jerusalem. People will be able to fly over and meet King Jesus, who's glorified. This is the glorified Christ we're talking about. Jesus is not going to veil his glory again. But if he appeared before mortals, he'd have to veil it. He'd have to veil it. You can't have mortals in the flesh and glorified people occupying the same territory at the same time. This can't happen. Glory dissipates mortality. As soon as the saints put on immortality, whenever you choose to think that is, death's going to be swallowed up in victory. There isn't going to be any more death. So people say, I know when the, after Jesus comes and everything, and we're all going to live to be a thousand years old. Well, frankly, I'm ashamed to be associated with people who think that. Death's going to be destroyed when the next time anyone's raised from the dead. He's going to speak them out of the grave, and when they come out, death's destroyed. In fact, death's going to even be cast in a lake of fire. Death and hell will be cast in a lake of fire. Nature will, this is going to precede, going to be shaken. I don't know all the details about this, and at this point I will admit to you I'm giving you what I think is a situation, but I think there's going to be a period of time, how long it is, I don't know, I've ever not be very brief, like a twinkle of an eye, when everybody's going to know the world's going, and they're not going to be able to do anything about it. Now, Jesus gave a hint to this in the parable of the ten virgins. They knew when, behold, he comes. They knew. They, 
And he quick, these people, they were, they once, they were there, you know, they were, they were virgins. Mm -hmm. yes. And their lamps were lit when they were started out, mm -hmm. but they ran out of oil. Yeah. And they come to the ones ahead and said, let us have some of your own. No, oh, no, the oil sharing time's done. Amen. We're not going to share any oil now. Anyone's going to get something from you about Jesus, they've got to get it before Jesus comes. Because when Jesus appears, oil supply is cut off. No more. And I think that's what's going to happen when Jesus comes. Things are going to, maybe that's what's happening now. Uh -huh. Things are heating up, you know. Yes. All these weather phenomenon and all that. Got the weather specialists confused. Maybe that's what's happened. Things begin to fall apart. He says even the heavenly bodies that are noted for their consistency, right? The heavenly bodies are noted for their consistency. Yeah. Why we say we can't even set our clocks by the movement of the heavenly bodies without being off a few seconds and have to throw in a leap year every once in a while. But those heavenly bodies are going to be disrupted. That's right. yeah. They're not going to be functioning. Mm -hmm. I think this will all happen rather rapidly, but it's going to happen long enough. That everyone that's on the outside is going to know what's coming. Amen. Would to God they cried at the rocks and mountains and fall on us. Yeah. Now the job of the church is to get people to start crying out now. Yeah. Amen. Let's throw away these mamby-pamby gospels that uh -huh. make people feel good and all this. Stuff. Let's get rid of those things. Yeah. So people can get ready for this. Yeah. The coming of the Lord. And they'll see the Son of Man coming, not hovering, coming. As I say, I think all this will actually be in kind of a twinkle of an eye, but there's a, there's a sequence. There's a sequence to it. The same, <laughs> they'll be saying, it's either lost to be saying, oh, no. Oh, no. He's coming. The saints will be saying, oh, glory. Oh, glory. We waited for him. He's coming just like he said he would. He's coming or it'll be a glad day. You will never be happier that you live for Christ than when you see him coming. They'll see him. All right, let's look at another text. This, that was a disruption of nature and everyone's going to see it. See him coming. They're going to see him. Peter tells you, incidentally, that in the day comes as a thief in the night, the heavens and earth will pass away with a great noise. So... It's not going to be the world like we know it. Yeah, yeah. Heavens and earth are going to pass away with a great noise. The elements melt with fervent heat. That's when he, when he, when he leaves. Mm -hmm. It's all going to be done away. Mm -hmm. Colossians 3, 4 says, When he shall appear, we also yeah. shall appear mm -hmm. with him in glory. Uh, you want to console your heart with this. I would venture to say that some of your saddest moments are when people you fervently desire for them to see who you are and to know your Savior, that they don't recognize you. This is a source of great heartbreak. Yeah. And you wish that you could... But this is how salvation works. God doesn't let the world know who you really are mm -hmm. until it really knows who Jesus really is. Yeah. When Jesus is really seen for who he is, yeah. then you'll be seen for who you are. Yeah. That's something's going to happen when he appears. Mm. That means his flesh is gone. <laughs> that means no more earthen vessel. When he shall appear, we also shall appear with him. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not we shall be snuck out. Yeah. We shall appear, we shall appear yeah, with him. Amen. In glory. So both sides are going to see us. Here and there. Now here's another. First Timothy 6, 14. First Timothy 6, 14 is talking about the exalted Christ. Paul admonishes Timothy, now keep this commandment to do what you've been given to do. Keep this commandment without spot. 
All right, Jesus is serious about this, brethren. Keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, whom God will show, could disclose him, who is the blessed only potentate, King of kings and Lord of lords. That's who he is. Multitudes of people in this city don't believe that. Yeah. And there's no nice way to say it. And some who say they believe it, I doubt it. And I'm not ashamed to say it either. Because any person who's not living holy, what, in spite of what they say, their faith is flawed to say the, to be as kind as you can. Something's wrong there. That's right. Because the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking Amen. for the blessed and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So when he appears in glory, we'll also appear. So be patient. I'll be patient. Don't be aggravated because people don't see you for who you are. Be patient. Yeah. Come into the Lord draws nigh, and God's going to show you when he shows his son. Yeah. That's the one you've been united with. That's when he, appe when he appears. See, this blast, this rapture theory, That's just right. blows it right plumb out of the water. Yeah. When he appears, yeah. we also will appear, appear with him in glory. Yes, amen. So it's not going to be something that's hidden. It is written that Jesus is not ashamed to call us brethren. Yes. Uh -huh. And I can tell you, if he snuck us out, there, there's some kind of shame there. Mm -hmm. To have us live in this world, undetected and unknown, and then to sneak us out and wait a thousand years before he lets us to be known. I'm doubting the sincerity of people that believe that. Yeah. I'm questioning that their heart is right. I'm questioning it. I'm saying I don't think that there's provision in salvation for people to think such things as that. Again, 2 Timothy 4.1. These has to do with his appearing now. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick, the living, and the dead at his appearing yeah. and kingdom and his kingdom will appear too at the same time Amen. who is he going to judge he's going to judge the quick and the dead and that's, it. that's all there are the living and the dead not the living saints and the dead saints this is the living and the dead everybody who died and everybody who's alive and has remained until his coming yeah. he's going to judge them at his appearing yeah. Yeah. that's what's going to take place Again, that D, the, this, this shows how much speculation mm -hmm. is in much teaching about the coming of the Lord. There's a series of books written called Left Behind. Yeah. Uh -huh. That series of books has split a lot of churches. Right. A lot of churches have formed divisions mm -hmm. over that series of books. Now, Tim LaHaye is going to have to answer for that. That's right. Amen. Woe to the person that defiles the body of Christ. Yes. Amen. Woe to them that cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine. Whoa, yes. whoa, you he may think he's right. So what? Mm -hmm. God's not going to allow his son's name to be dragged through the mud and misconceptions to be made and then just gloss the thing over like it never took place. Oh no. That's right. Oh no. You cannot tamper mm -hmm. with anything God has said about his son. You can't do it. I don't think any of you do, but it's just good to... That's right. I need this uh, affirmation. I don't like this India rubber theology. I don't like it. This yeah. theology that bends and accommodates to everybody and makes you feel comfortable with situations that aren't good. I don't like this kind of thing. Yeah. I like it st straightforward, just like he said it. Amen. And when he appears, some crowns are going to be distributed. Yes. 
2 Timothy 4, 8. Henceforth is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but to all them that love his appearing. So I ask you the question. Do you love his appearing? Yes, it is. It's, a, it's a probing question, is it? It's something to ponder. Do you love his appearing? Well, one way we can tell is if you talk about it, you know, sing about it. We like to sing these songs about the coming of the Lord, you know. They're not too popular anymore. <laughs> love his appearing. We love to think about it. We love to anticipate it. We love to think about what's going to happen when it comes. And see, to those that love his appearing, the crown of righteousness. Yes, amen. See, what's that mean, crown of righteousness? That means nobody's going to doubt you're righteous. Yes. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. There'll be nothing about you that detracts from you being righteous. Yes. All the things that detract will be removed, the earthen vessel, every, the house of clay, all that's going to be gone. The law of sin is in your members. The other law that's warring against the law of your mind is all going to be gone. At his appearing, then you'd be crowned yeah. as a person who won the race. <laughs> now, brother, that crown's worth everything. There, yeah. there, isn't, there isn't anything required of us that is worth forfeiting mm -hmm. that crown. Amen. And grace of God teaches us to look for Christ's coming. The grace of God teaches you. So people that don't, that aren't looking, haven't been taught by grace. Titus 2.13, well, 11 through 13 says, The grace of God that brings salvation, that grace, the grace that saves you, grace that brings salvation has appeared to all men. That is, he brought salvation within reach mm -hmm. of all men. Yeah. If anybody's not saved, it's not because they didn't have a chance. Amen. You say, well, they never heard. How do you know they never heard? God positioned people Acts 17, 26, and 27, God positioned people in geography, geographically and in time so they would seek the Lord if happily they might find him. So everybody has been positioned by God in the world so they could seek God. If they don't seek him, it's not because somebody didn't tell them to do it. Right. It's built in the human nature. That's what God did. That's why it's so wrong not to seek God. God made man to seek him. And grace teaches those people, those people who are saved to look. Yeah. I say to anticipate, mm -hmm. yeah. to expect and long for mm -hmm. the appearing of the great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. They're anticipating it. They'll be glad to be released from the bands of mortality. Glad to be released from imperfection. Yeah. Amen. Glad to be released from not being able to do what you really want to do for the Lord. Yes, amen. Now, you can sit and cry about it now if you want. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, quite candidly, we are reduced to tears about our own ineffectiveness. Mm -hmm. Now, you got to stop crying. It's not a, just like Nehemiah said to his people, listen, don't be sorry today. Yeah. This isn't the time for sorrow. Start rejoicing because God has a, has a day of coronation yes, amen. for you. Amen. And the grace of God will teach you. It will teach you how to look for it. You say, I don't know how to do it. Grace will teach you how to look for it. If you live within the boundary of grace's influence, pretty soon you'll start knowing how to look and how to anticipate and how to prepare and how to long for it. That's grace's job to teach you that. We, we can't teach you that. We, we've tried. We, if we could, we'd teach you. We can just tell you what God said and, and urge you to take hold of the grace of God. And if you take hold of the grace of God, it'll teach you. That's right. Effectively teach you. Amen. It'll effectively teach you to anticipate Christ's coming. So when he comes, you'll not be taken unawares. Amen. See, so God's made full provision. It all hinges on his appearing, see? Yeah, uh -huh. His appearing. <clears throat> and Hebrews 9.28, of course, said he's, he's going to appear the second time without sin. It doesn't mean he's not going to have sin, although he won't have sin. Uh, he bore our sins in his body on the tree, Peter said, 1 Peter 2.24. He bore our sins in his body, in his body, 
in his body yeah. on the tree. Mm -hmm. But when he rose from the dead, <laughs> they weren't in that body. Yeah. And they aren't in his glorified body. He's not going to come back uh -huh. to deal with sin. Yeah. I'm sorry, he's not coming back to fight any battles. Yeah. The battles have done been fought. He's destroyed the devil, Hebrews 2.14. He's spoiled principalities and powers, mm -hmm. Colossians 2.15. So Jesus has already dissipated all the power of the devil. Yeah. The last enemy, by definition, yeah. uh -huh. is death, and Jesus has conquered it. So there isn't any enemies left for Jesus to conquer. Amen. So when he returns, uh -huh. everyone's going to see mm -hmm. that the enemies have already become been conquered. Yeah. Yeah, someone says, yeah, but what about, what about the battle of Armageddon? What about that? Yeah. Doesn't it say the devil's going to gather them together? Yes, it does. Yeah. But read the rest of the text. Right. After they all got together, fire come down and destroyed them all. Yeah, that's right. Amen. So his fight's not even going to be fought. Yeah. Right. Going to gather in vain. <laughs> and Peter, he holds out another pers uh -huh. perspective of the appearing. The appearing, 1 Peter 1, 7, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than that of gold that perishes. Now God is presently testing each one of us to see if our, not so he'll see, he knows already. So we can see whether our faith is valid or not. Whether our professed faith is just pretentious maybe. So he tries your faith. He puts you in the fire of trial that boils the stuff that can't get into glory, yeah. boils it up to the top. But the trial of your faith be much more precious than gold. That's a precious trial. Though it be tried to the fire, might be found. Your faith might be found to the praise and honor and glory at the appearing. Here it is again. At the appearing. Everybody who kept the faith, that means you kept hold of it. Everyone who fought a good fight of faith, you, you fought to keep it. You didn't let it go. When Jesus appears, <laughs> your trials are over. Amen. And it could happen any time, any hour. Peter, he talked to spiritual leaders. 1 Peter 5.4 he said, when the shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So before that, he told him in verse 2, feed the flock of God. Now feed the flock of God. Feed the flock of God over which the Holy Spirit made you overseers. Feed those saints. Nourish them up. Build them up. Strengthen their hand in the Lord. Help them to gain the prize. And then when Jesus appears, You'll receive a crown. You'll receive a crown of glory. You you took care of his sheep. Now listen, brethren. There's a lot of pastors and a lot of preachers that aren't taking care of their sheep. Yeah, that's right. Oh, I understand they're meeting their earthly needs and things like this, but I mean their people are starving right under their nose. They're starving to death. They're not able to survive the difficulties of life. Amen. Remember when that tornado hit uh -huh. Joplin when was it May 11th pardon 23rd wasn't it 22nd 1911 I received a call from a dearly beloved minister I won't mention his name but you probably know him he said could you help me brother Given, because we've got a number of people in our church that are asking why this happened. The Christian people now, they're asking why this happened. And I told me, I, yes, I can help you on that. I said, I have an idea that if you trace the path of that tornado, you would find a number of things had been destroyed that had no business being here. I have an idea you'd find out there's some people their door, the, their time was up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. They've been given the opportunity to repent and they didn't. Mm -hmm. You'll find other people, they had prepared and there was no further need for them to stay. Yeah. Yeah. So they were here. Mm -hmm. And you will find that God was making a name for himself. Yeah. Mm 
Don't tempt me. And if you receive me, expect to be blessed. God's people have no right to ask why. That's the one thing Job asked was why. That's the one question he asked. And after he had a talk with God, he laid his hand on his mouth and said, I'm not going to say another word. That's it. That's it. Amen. Remember, he said, if I could just produce my cause. Because Job was so righteous, he couldn't understand why this happened. What, what, I haven't done anything that justified this in my eyes. Why? Then God appeared to him and said, now, gird up your loins like a man, Job. I'm going to ask a few questions of you. He said, like, where were you when the world was created? Now, how about that big serpent Leviathan? Can you put a hook in his nose? What he was telling Job was, you are surrounded with things you don't understand. You're surrounded with them. Every day of your life, you have to face things you don't understand. But here you have balked because you couldn't understand why I did it. He never did tell. He never did tell Job. He told us. Job never did know why that why that all happened, that it wasn't him at all. It was God showing Satan that Job was flawed, was flawless. Amen. That's what it was all about. Your faith is being tried like that too. It's not as severe because probably your faith isn't as strong. But when he appears, your faith is going to be vindicated. Whatever it takes to believe God and keep the faith and be faithful. Stop griping, stop murmuring, stop asking a bunch of questions all the time, just like stop it and start trusting. Amen. And God will lean down and he'll strengthen you. Amen. He'll send the angels to protect right. you. Amen. Jesus will intercede for you. The Holy Spirit will intercede for you from within. And things you don't know what to ask for as you ought. John said this about those he was teaching. He said, little children, <clears throat> abide in him. See, that's where God puts you. God, God puts you in Christ. Yeah. 1 Corinthians 1.30, of him are you in Christ Jesus. So God puts you in Christ. Now, now stay there. So that when he shall appear, uh -huh. we may have confidence, we're the ones that converted you, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Now, I'm, I don't want to be ashamed uh -huh. when Jesus appears. Amen. I don't want anyone I've taught to have to be ashamed when uh -huh. Jesus appears. Yes. See, I teach... I preach and teach for this purpose. I really don't I really don't care what people think about it. I really don't. Some people say, well, what I think, I don't really care what you think at all about what I'm doing. I'm doing this so that when Jesus appears, neither you nor I will be ashamed. Amen. That's the aim. Yeah. Amen. And salvation has provided all the resources required for that to happen. Yeah. For you not to be ashamed, and for those who taught you not to be ashamed before him at his coming. But you see, when he shall appear, Christ's appearing is certain, it's yeah. not ambiguous. Everything in salvation is really calculated to get you ready for that yes. appearing. It'll happen in a moment in a twinkling of an eye at the last trump. Yeah. The trumpet shall sound. The dead in Christ shall be raised. We that are alive and remain be caught to meet him in the air. And he's going to judge the wicked at the same time he glorifies the righteous, yeah. 2 Thessalonians says. Mm -hmm. So if we can make it to that day, you do it just by taking advantage of what God's given. See, we're not asking for like something superhuman to be done. Just take, just take what God's given in salvation. Take it seriously. You have to serve Christ. You've got to make enemies. Make them. You have to serve Christ. You've got to leave something. Leave it. You have to serve Christ. You have to get hold of something you don't have. Get hold of it. Make it your aim. 
when he appears, by God's grace, I'll be ready. Amen. And if you are resolved in that, God will see to it yes, amen. that you are ready. <laughs> Praise God.